Welcome Spartans to Halo Book Club, part of Evolved, your home for Halo. Halo Book Club goes beyond the video games and covers Halo's extended media lore from novels, short stories, comic books, and more. It's time for Halo Book Club! I'm your host, Aaron, and with me today we've got Lucas. Nanobots, engage. And we've got David. Yay, nanobots! Aaron's favourite. No nanobots. This Halo Book Club is on the Rubicon Protocol. Or just Rubicon Protocol, I believe. Right, before we get started, I will dive into the socials. If you're new to the show, welcome. Halo Book Club is part of Evolved. We host a variety of other shows. We've got the main show podcast Evolved, Mission Debrief, Builds with Blocks, Halo TV Plus, Halo Gear Guide, and Halo Headlines. Evolved also partners with HCS Pro Talk, where Josh and Will discuss all the latest happenings in the competitive Halo scene, week by week, with an emphasis on the community. You can learn more about all of our shows on the website, EvolvedHalo.com. If you're already a fan, please take a minute to leave us a review of the show on your podcast service of choice. We greatly appreciate all the feedbacks. We would also like to take a moment to thank all of our patrons for their continued support. Your contributions allow us to continue to make stuff just like this. Thank you very much, guys. Seriously, it never ceases to amaze me. We had another new patron in like the last week that gave us loads of money. It was like, oh, wow. Never. Every time I get that email and I still get a happy feeling. So thank you very much. That's mental. Christmas on like a weekly basis or like a monthly basis? Patreon's crazy. People are crazy out there. Yeah, I always said the day I don't get excited about a new patron is the day I've done enough of this show and I should retire. So still excited about it. So thank you very much. If you would like to learn more about becoming a patron, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Halo Evolved and you can learn about all the benefits such as early access to episodes, unique swag, access to the secret discord channel, access to our soundtrack, and possibly some new things because I know Ian's been talking about shuffling up our rewards for a little bit. So that might change soon and there could be more stuff or different stuff. So keep an eye out on that as well. Finally, we encourage all of our listeners to support Audible, where they can enjoy the growing collection of Halo novels all in one place, along with thousands of other novels, guided wellness programs, and more. Use the URL audibletrial.com forward slash podcast evolve to learn more and start your free trial today. Can I recommend using your free trial and downloading Rubicon Protocol, narrated by the lovely Scott Brick himself, so you can have a nice listen to that. Ooh, right. Book info. David, do you want to take us through all the excitement so you are listening to the book halo book club halo Ru rubicon protocol i almost said that as well i keep trying to say it but halo rubicon protocol the author is kelly gay publisher is galley books um where formats are pretty much everything guys you can get it in print audio and ebook um the lads would have listened to audio and i did the ebook um the release date was august 9th 2022 as we all know this was delayed multiple times to get us here um, the length is 352 pages or 10 hours and 13 minutes in audiobook form. You guys can confirm with me, is that, this feels like a short book? Was that a short for audiobook? I can't recall like the hours for Halo books. That's mid-range. Yeah, that's probably middle of the road. I'd say between 8 to 12 hours is usually like the ballpark for a Halo novel. So the summary of the book is 2560. Humanity finds its back against the wall after the United Nations Space Command's flagship Infinity dropped out of this place into a devastating ambush launched by the Banished. As this fierce enemy alliance seeks to claim a powerful weapon hidden within the ancient Forerunner ring world known as Zeta Halo, the surviving UNSC forces now find themselves compromised and its leadership out of reach, with remaining personnel forced to abandon ship and take their chances on the fractured, unpredictable surface of the Halo ring. Now survival in this strange alien environment, whether for Spartan super soldiers or those who never thought they would see the battle up close, is measured day to day against the relentless and brutal adversary that has always has the upper hand. Desperation grows, but the will to keep fighting and enduring no matter the odds is never in doubt, even as the banished seek to unleash a frightening new enemy that could doom them all. There's the stakes of the book. The timeline is December 5th, 2559, which, if you recall, is just before the intro cinematics for Halo Infinite. And the book ends on May 25th, 2560, a mere three days before Chief wakes up 
at the beginning of Halo Infinite as well. So that's where all our time place takes place. Um, the location is entirely on Zeta Halo, which might be a Halo novel's first, if not rare, situation where we're only in one location for the entirety of the book. I want to say that's probably actually the only book that's done that. The flood was... The flood was, yeah, it was all on the ring, wasn't it? Yeah, you're right. The various characters involved, there aren't actually too many, which is pretty good, uh, even though I still did struggle sometimes to hold who was who in my brain, because um, it's almost an entirely new cast, not including some of the recurring characters that you see from the game. So we have Spartan Benita Stone, you have Spartan Nina Kovan, Eric Bender, who is a barber, you have Gavin Joe, who is a mortician, Spartan Thomas Horvath, you have Lucas Browning, that's right, THE Lucas Browning, you have TJ Murphy, Robin Demick, uh, and Isaiah Cameron. You also have two, the two kind of banished characters in this book is a new brood character called Gorion and Jaga, the elite, as you remember from the games. So this is pretty cool. So that's kind of the book's introduction and some of our intro characters. I don't think there's anyone else really that's, that's to be called out. Yeah, there's a few others I didn't throw in. Like we get the monitors, but they're not in it for that long. We get a little bit of a uh, Chacklock in his tower, but and we have the Harbinger as well. But they're not really super characters in it, and we sort of know who they are anyway. Like a few of these characters are new, and some of them we've only seen. Like uh, when you've played the campaign, you pillage Stone's corpse and steal her enhanced shields, but she's already dead. Um, we don't come across Kovan, she's still alive by the end of this. Uh, same with Horvath. But we do get audio from Horvath at the end of the, uh, or at least through the audio logs. I don't think we get anything through Kovan. There's a few random ones. I think is Kovan not the one that takes her drop pod through a ship? Yes, we do get an audio we log. We get audio from log her. of that stuff, yeah. There are, like, we do get little glimpses of them, but. Stone, I think, is the only one we actually physically see because she's a corpse. And then, like, we get the audio logs with Lucas. And that's probably all of them. Like, Gorian's another. He, you know, I know he's dead before we get to play the game, but he's another one then that we don't actually experience. But then we get Jaga, so... To start off, because I'm not going to go through this chapter by chapter. I know we do sometimes, but this book's pretty fresh and... We'll just sort of chat along as we go. But what's your like initial feelings on this book? Because this is the first time now, I think really since the flood that we have got like a piece of companion lore that tackles the stuff around the game. Yeah, like a true a true tie-in to the game. Yeah. I think the idea of it's really clever. I liked that um the book is kind of set up in the game, looking like at the flashbacks. I remember some of the most in more interesting of the Spartan logs were talking about like their guerrilla warfare and their time in the months preceding before Chief waking up. I remember you, you probably everyone remembered th them talking about Rubicon Protocol when that was like initiated and it's like a free for all that was kind of okay, that's kind of exciting. And then when the book got announced, it was like, okay, the book is clearly going to be based here with this time period. And that's a very interesting time because obviously we, we know next to nothing we've complained numerous times in numerous shows about from where the intro scene cuts to where Chief wakes up, we still know so little about what happened in that time. So it's kind of interesting to see like some of the holes filled in. I think they do a good job tying in some of the kind of audio logs in, in, into this. And obviously, they totally explain the thing I've complained numerous times about of how the hell is Lucas Browning making these recordings. Uh, I thought that was kind of cool that they actually had a whole storyline involved in that. And, you know, it's kind of sad sad kind of characters they made me care about i think overall it's a good book i think it felt very weird it didn't feel like to me a kelly gay book because i think i was missing some of her characters and i felt like because it's it seems very rigid because obviously it's tying in with a game and i know i'd love to talk to her about like what it was like writing this compared to the others because i can imagine it's got to be a very different experience and um, based on what it's giving us ultimately i thought it was a really good book wish we could still knew more at the end of it but it is exciting where it leaves us with a couple of characters still kicking around. So my thoughts on it are it definitely brings the the fight the UNSC had with the Banished more to life in, in a sense. It's like when you play the games, it really feels like all these separated Marines, especially the ones you rescue, are just kind of like 
on their own. They're not really coordinated and and they're just kind of scattered all over the place. And while they are scattered, I mean, even after we lose the reverie, they are still talking to each other. They're still fighting, you know, the banished. They're not just kind of walking around like a chicken with his head cut off sort of a thing. Like there's so much more involved going on, especially because like they'll stop at a forward operating base and like exchange data with other people. And that, you know, these are all hardened fighters after a few months of surviving on the ring. So, and, and I agree with a lot of David's, David's points where like, it, it definitely, I definitely feel like it fills in a lot of plot holes, especially like she said about Lucas Browning. I personally wish that this would have been launched or dropped sooner and i know there's probably there's probably an actual legitimate reason why it couldn't have launched whether it's you know they couldn't get the print or they were saving it because at the end of the book uh, it really hints to more story to come for the halo infinite storyline so the, and those are about my thoughts of the same i'm curious to see i'd the same i'd love to know the reason why it took so long to come out Part of me wonders if maybe this book used to cover more territory. There are, there was talk that Halo Infinite had its campaign cut back. I wonder, did this book go a little further in the future at some point than the last scene where we see Hovarth and maybe it had to go back to the drawing board to fill it out and cut some things off it, you know? So along that note, can I ask you a question? An audiobook question. Did you notice, I think it was when Stone was in outpost Tremonius and I think it was then but it seemed like there was some cut audio points where like you almost felt like they skipped a whole section like they might have already written it and then recorded it and then we're like okay we have to take this out because it's not in the campaign anymore oh interesting possibly I it didn't catch me when I was listening but I do notice that sometimes in other audiobooks you will hear the very definite cuts where other audio has been sliced in. Like, I know from when we talked to Scott that sometimes that's just down to, oh, no, we, we did another take and we've mashed the two of them together. But I could entirely see, like, if you told me that this project was delayed because it had to go back into surgery and they had to get Kelly to do rewrites because they went, oh, hang on a minute, this stuff that you wrote is no longer in the game that we're putting out. So we need to like fix this up again and move stuff and take stuff out. I just, I have a sneaking suspicion. I wonder, is that possibly why? Like there are definitely issues out there with getting books manufactured and printed at the minute. And there's other supply chain issues. But I wonder, is that why all of our Halo novels got pushed back? I think it's probably a mix of both. But I, I think the, the campaign rewrites, that makes total sense to me of like why it would delay this book specifically. Especially if, like, maybe there's more logs, maybe there's more places, maybe more interactions, maybe even more characters that we should have been interacting in the game that are in this book that had to go and had to maybe read the story of really. And it's probably easy enough to do in certain places because of the book's format based in these number of days. They could just say, oh, day 57, we did a whole bunch of shit. And they're like, well, we, you don't go there anymore. So just take out day 57 and continue with the next chapter. And maybe the book kind of as well because I don't think it doesn't refer back to itself too much because the guys are constantly on the move and constantly running as the story is always going forward so it's kind of cool I don't know I, I think I like those ideas that's very possible yeah because it also makes me wonder then that the other Halo novel that's been delayed is the one with the Arbiter in it and there were big rumors that at some stage they were going to have like missions in Infinite that weren't on infinite that weren't on zeta halo there was like remember the big talk that was that they were going to have like side missions that were standard run of the middle linear halo missions like that was a rumor for a while that oh you'll go and you'll catch up with the arbiter on saying helios you know you'll be playing as someone else or you'll go and you'll see what blue team are at and all this like i know that could have all been absolute pie in the sky stuff but i wonder is that why it could be why all of our books got pushed back. So, something to think about, but I doubt we'll never get the answer to that. That's the thing. We'll be sitting here in 10 years when it leaks, and then we'll be like, fuck, we were right. Aaron, you brought up an interesting thing. Throughout this book, they mentioned numerous times, Blue Team was on Infinite, Blue Team was on Infinite. But I'm pretty sure we were told Blue Team was not on Infinite. That isn't there Spartan Logs with, like, Lasky saying to, like, Halsey, I've taken Blue Team and sent him away? Yeah, he just says I've I've tasked them on something else, but he doesn't actually say 
I've sent them away or what he's done with them. So, like... Maybe I made that up in my head. No, I think, like, no one else seems to know that they weren't on Infinity at the time, but he says he tasked them with another job because they were free and the Chief, you know, Chief is doing this mission and they don't need the rest of Blue Team Fort, so they've sent them somewhere else. So I suppose, in theory, they could be... Like, they could be anywhere. They could be on another part of the Halo. They could be completely in a different part of space. But I think that was just like a quick, hey, we need to get these guys out of the way. I would agree, though. I, I thought, I always thought it could have been Osiris because if uh, Vale is in that book with the Arbiter, it could be Osiris that was tasked out on another. Because I, I thought someone, either them or um, Blue Team or Osiris, was tasked on like another planet that it got mentioned by Lasky. Yeah, they definitely said something about Locke being somewhere. I can't remember what it was, probably the reference to it was. But anyway, yeah. That makes sense, and maybe the next, maybe Troy's book will tell us more about that. The stuff that's happening out and around. I'm excited to, to hear how. I mean, maybe even that sets up for DLC or, or some more story beats for Halo Infinite. They might end up on the Halo Halo Infinite as well. For sure, especially because like, okay, like the the success of this book, like the end goal is like we're putting out the message to say where the ring is. So. Presumably that then opens up the doors for anybody to show up on the ring that we need to find. We have a story reason why the UNSC is here or maybe ex-Covenant comes, more banished come. Maybe there's, um, like you said, the Swords and Helios show up. And then I feel like they should have put that in Halo Infinite. Like the fact that like a message, and I mean, maybe nobody else knows. That's the reason why we don't see it in Halo Infinite. Yeah, we, we talked about it once or twice. Like it's a really buried fact that the ring actually went through slip space and moved away from infinite like that's buried in one or two small places throughout the book and like throughout the uh, sorry the book the, the audio logs in the game so like i remember thinking like that should have been a bigger deal i feel like that was a bigger plot point of halo infinite it was totally glossed over and buried a little bit oh absolutely and like literally like they like yeah again like you said like you can send so many different factions can come i mean hell we could have a UNSC faction and it's being sent to human space. Maybe the insurrectionists find it too. And we get like a three-way battle, but or a four-way battle. We can get the insurrectionists, the UNSC, the banished, and maybe forerunners. Or where's the rest of the created? Do you know what I mean? All that kind of stuff. There's loads of stuff out there. I don't know what's going to happen with the created as, um, because Cortana has gone. Like that is the real question is, is like, are they, is it kind of like fragmented covenant? Like after the, you know, the human covenant war, or are they just, still following the 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 rules of cortana's i guess peace quote unquote peace that she tried to make okay so i want to say um while reading this book i it, it's early on in the book and i thought it was hilarious that when they got to the mortal reverie the fact how murphy comments about eating pizza <laughs> and, and like i've never like he says this is like the happiest moment like eating these slices of cheese pizza and they're like cheap cardboardy pizza that you know are made for unsc ships but he's like oh thank god i can eat pizza again and i'm like i want to find something that i love just as much as the way they love pizza in this book <laughs> it's a good moment also would definitely would have liked to have seen the mortal reverie like in its heyday like that whole battle just sounded so cool like the build-up was so class i, I really like really loved how they how they set all that up I kind of wish we could go through the ship more like you kind of because in the book they kind of find the uh, route that you know the way that chief goes up through to get out to um is that the way that chief gets into um outpost tremonius or is that the way that you know the boat crew and like bro crew and stone go down or is it like underneath the outpost tremonius like the way they find themselves to get in they do mention that like there's lo because after the battle there was loads of rock slides and stuff so, like the, all the, the topography's all changed so like how you get in and around it's different uh, which is a nice way of saying that like why it doesn't look anything like it sounds here of like you don't see any signs of a massive battle and you imagine it's because like so much of the ship is actually more fucked up now than it was before so I imagine how they get in and around is probably a bit different it's probably hard to find yeah, probably but I you know I just wish we could have gotten inside the reverie and like seen like I mean you could have seen like the signs of battle and like all like I mean they're talking about they're saying there it's a hundred 
banished to, you know, one human and they were still, you know, holding on for a day or two. And I mean, they were talking about how they had people that weren't even soldiers that were fighting. Like, I mean, half the boat crew aren't even combat. The only the only real combat people are the Spartans. And I, I mean, maybe Lucas Browning because he is a Marine, but like Murphy's a pilot. Cam's communications. Dimmick's is safe. Well, she deals with like explosives, but she's a firefighter. And then Gavin Joe is essentially a, a he's a mortician, so he works with dead bodies. So none of them signed up to be soldiers. Other than that, like I mean, going through the book, um, we did have a new sub monitor. Yes, very surprised at that. Oh, I like Veridity. Yeah, she sounds great. She sounds a little crazy, kind of like how Guilty Spark is, but she seems to be very determined to get rid of the Banished. She reminds me a lot of Exuberant Witness from Halo 5, so I'm like, yeah, bring this character into the game, please. Because we already they complained we didn't get enough of the Spawned Empire. Um, who sound, she's like, sounded way different in this book as well as the Spawned Empire, but um, I was expecting that scene to drag out way more than it did. But it's just like, won't you... Verdi just said the magic word of Harbinger. She like switched on. I'm like, hey, here, here, you need to go, 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 go. Yeah, she seemed so like blase, like nonchalant. Like, uh, yeah, you know, th- they'll be gone and like after a while, that always happens. And then literally she's like, oh, the Harbinger's awake. And it's like, it's like panic mode ensues. But then she becomes kind of like a, kind of a bitch. And like Verdi's like, okay, I'm going to go help the humans. And she's like, no, 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 no. Like, you got to stay with me and like, this is my show, you know, you have to do what I say. Yeah, very much so. I wasn't the hugest fan of the fact that, like, at the end, it, it's only kind of, like, mentioned that Veridity, like, saves, like, the boat crew. Like, Lucas gets captured, and then Cam and Murphy die at the very end of the book because of, uh, cause they're fighting the Banished. And then well, I, I expected everybody to die there, and I found that weird that, like, they mentioned that just this get-out-of-jail-free card of, like, she shows up whisk them away that definitely sounds like maybe something that got cut at the end sort of a thing you know like we were talking about earlier and it just very briefly mentioned that yeah hey they she came by and she just teleported them she heated them away you know so they are they're somewhere on the ring that we don't know same with horvath he just kind of got teleported away and now he's trying to find more survivors what are your thoughts on um gorian he was cool and his, we heard a little bit more about Banished Society from him when he's talking to Horvath um, at the campfire. About the pups and like, what did he refer to him? Like, I can't remember that creature he described. And he referred to him as a pup. I don't remember exactly what the creature's name, but he did talk about how the females raised the young. You know, I, I just, I thought I, there was, again, more plot armor that uh, is in this book, especially when... Horvath and Gorian, like, they get on the Sentinel and fly across open space to get away. And essentially, Horvath is, like, immobilized because he's got a giant shard in his side. And Gorian's just like, oh, you're not strong enough. I'm going to go. I'm just going to walk away. And I was like, ah. But then there's the uh, the nanobots. The nanobots. Nanobots. Aaron, what do you think of nanobots? I don't like nanobots because they are the get-out-of-jail excuse for everything in science fiction. Ever since the day that they used them as the excuse to change Chief's armor, instead of just not acknowledging it, they could have just left it alone, but they threw it in there as an excuse, and since then, we're plagued with nanobots. Oh, this Spartan can make their armor look however they want, because it's nanotechnology. Fuck off. Just, just don't. I'm sorry you feel that way. But they only really mentioned it once. Like, that was the only really time they mentioned it. Like, they didn't... Like, Stone wasn't coming back. Like, at the end of the book, Kovan's like, they're ripping her armor off of her. And she's not getting nanobots to repair herself then. This is the thing that gets me with the nanobots. Oh, Chief can use them to change his codpiece while he's in stasis, but Kovan can't fix the dent in her helmet. They seem very irrational about when they work and when they don't. They did do a good job of, like, really selling the, um, we have fuck all stuff. So, like, their armor is constantly breaking down. Bits of it are short-circuiting. They're, like, really not operating at peak performance. I think they did a kind of good job selling you with that. I expected to get for them to get out of the armor much quicker. I didn't think they'd last that long, to be perfectly honest with you. 
No, and I also like like the how different their armors are, and they have all their little AIs, uh, and they're all very different AIs. And like I think like they Stone was mentioned to have her upgraded uh, shielding, but then like Horvath um, or my bad Kovan's stuff is all about blending in because she's the this stoic person, or was it Stone that had the camouflage? No, I think Hovarth had the Hovarth has like bafflers and stuff for like camouflage and stealth, and then Stone had the shields, and I think Kovan had active camo up until it died. So they all like sort of have something, but I di- I did like the way they kind of set up. Like you get a you get a good insight into how the Spartan fours function day to day. Like you don't really have this in. You don't get a blue team novel where they're worried about the chips in their armor breaking down. You're like, I can see where Halsey didn't skimp on the Spartan 2 armor, whereas the Spartan armor for the 4s is very much like, this is a slightly lesser equipment and they are prone to a little more damage and we require a whole song and dance to keep these Spartan teams running in peak efficiency, whereas not once in like Silent Storm or anything else or any of the other like blue team books do you ever have chief going oh damn it my chip's broken like they take some damage occasionally but not to the level of like at no point is anyone ever going oh my armor's operating at 52 percent efficiency on blue team whereas i feel like it's just a constant race to the bottom but the spartan fours they're like we have no repair equipment we are just on a constant downhill trajectory towards no armor and nearly no Spartan because like they're even talking about their artificial organs needing maintenance. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, Kovan, I mean, especially with like Kovan because she's and they do mention it after it happens like the first time where like her essentially her gel layer like locks up and it like goes on the fritz and she essentially falls over. And then they kind of mentioned it once, but like she never really had any other issues. I was expecting like in the middle of the fight against the banisher like the very end of the book that like that might happen and then like that is how she dies because or that is how maybe she gets captured yeah her armor locks up i was expecting more maybe a little bit more of that that was a great brutal scene where they're talking about all the prisoners being captured and lucas is describing all the, the spartans they bring in and the banish just like ripped them to pieces to get the armor off them oh yeah absolutely tearing them apart and smashing them one thing i'm kind of wondering and i don't know like i'm sure this is in the lore at some point but i thought if a spartan's armor was breached from the outside they self-destructed was that not a thing in the lore established with the spartan twos that was definitely twos i don't think it was ever fours though twos had 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 that auto destruct thing yeah like chief self-destructs is it Daisy's armor? Doesn't she die on the unyielding Hierophant? And he like he uses her suit and overloads the core. I think it might be Daisy. When they're in like the brute temple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's her. But I was sure there was some mention in the lore that if you breached a Spartan's armor, you know, if you tried to tear them out of it, basically, they go kaboom, and I'm like It's a certain generation for sure, or a certain mark of armor. I don't think it's in the newer ones. Because they're, like you said, like the fours are much lighter. They're, they're kind of a simpler design. Yeah, Griffin really needed to go down that road and just like self-destruct rather than get captured and taken to the tower for six months. Could be just the Spartan 2s because even the Spartan 3s, because they had the SPI armor, they never had that issue. And in Halo Reach, when the Spartans die, they none of them self-destruct either. And also, you have to put that into my head, Aaron. That was Griffin in the cell beside Lucas, right? Yes. Oh, that was definitely Griffin. Yeah, cool. He just says, I, you know, I can't tell you who I am because it's for your own good, but, like, it's definitely him that he's torturing the entire time. At first, I, um, I had a buddy who, who was like, what if that... Originally, he was like, what if that's Lasky before... That's exactly what I thought. And and then, but as you're going on, you're hearing him being tortured and being Chacklock's favorite tortured torture buddy and... And then you're like, okay, this is definitely Griffin, because by the time we get to finding Griffin in Halo Infinite, he's like, he's been through some shit, and he just, like, he just dies. Yeah, he's just, like, he's hanging on till he sees Chief, Chief, and then it's just like, nope, I'm out of here. But it is interesting, I would say, how they got... How, how Griffin told Chief about the conservatory is like, okay, so Lucas Browning meets the Harbinger, um, and then he meets 
Kovan, I think he tells Kovan about it, or Kovan realizes it from Viridi, but then he keeps going to conservatory to meet with the Harbinger, and then every time he comes back, he's essentially like downloading as much as he can onto Griffin, except for the fact that he can't tell Griffin about what the Harbinger is like showing him. Like he literally like can't. That was kind of frustrating. I really wanted to know what was going on there. I, I was kind of hoping they would have given us a bit more information. They throw little teases in that make you wonder because she has that line, she has it in the audio logs as well and she says it in the book, this silence I will speak and you will listen, which is very much a quote from the grave mind and you're like, as she starts to like reprogram his mind as she talks and like corrupts him, you're like, is, is this like, is this where the grave mind and the precursors got the logic plague from or did they give this ability to these people? Yeah, maybe. Maybe she's like, doing some weird mental interrogation or something yeah like you get to the point where lucas is like all i can say is numbers and these words and he talks about like closed space and it sounds like he's discussing aspects of the the harbinger and her people like being left behind in the closed space and then he can only reel off these numbers and i'm sure they have an importance that someone just hasn't figured out yet but if anyone can figure out the relevance of like numbers it's the halo community i would say i was expecting him to say a longer string of numbers like in the when he's talking to griffin and being like oh if you put this number in somewhere in halo infinite it might open some secret passage and we might get you know some secret information unless they're like their coordinates to where the endless came from or something like that i don't know yeah so i'm curious about that because it definitely seems logic plague-esque very much, you know, the grave mind, like, ruining you with words. So that's interesting, but what else have we not talked about? We haven't talked about the scene with Kovan and Browning when they are in the Phantom. That was, that was the turning point. I know you said it to me, Lucas. You were like, oh my god, chapter 26. And up to then, I was kind of met on the book because, like, these characters aren't really doing it for me. I thought the story was going to be a bit more... And then it kind of gets to that, and I was like, oh shit, okay, they're here, they're going for the fields. There are two points when Scott Brick's delivery like got me properly emotional. One was when uh, the Agent Sterling shoots herself, and the other was this scene in the back of the Phantom. Like, his delivery both times, I think he, he does a really good dramatic Lucas, and you really feel it as he gets upset. He, like, he really does land it, and you definitely... When, when she takes her helmet off to talk to him and you're just like, oh, okay, I'm getting like proper choked up here. And it was the same whenever Horvat's talking to the agent and gives her the gun because he can't bring himself to shoot her. I, I think those were the two moments in this novel where I was like, I'm just going to pause this and take a little minute and just go somewhere else. Uh, so that scene with Horvath and the Oni agent very much reminds me of... Um, what game is it? Gears of War 2. When you go down into like the locust like hide and so Dom, Dom's wife. Oh yeah, Dom's the whole Dom's wife scene and like but he actually shoots his wife. And but this is but it, it kinda reminded me of that. And like that was a scene that was hard to to play through. And this this was hard to listen to. Um and then with the Lucas one, like the whole like Kovan, like you can start seeing like the emotions between the two of them. Like she's not some super soldier like robot like that kind of made the spartan twos you know she's very she's got her emotions and and you know especially with lucas like he's just all he wanted to make sure was is everybody else in the boat crew survived yeah it's uh it definitely that bit hits you hard and it makes you feel all the sorrier for the poor guy like the fact he's still alive out there is just like oh i didn't even think about that for a second yeah, he's still alive. Like, we need a DLC where, like, we get Kovan and, like, she rescues. Like, like that would be the best redemption arc. Yeah, the only thing is he could be rescued by now because we do liberate the tower in the campaign. And th when they're having this discussion, it's only about a week before Chief comes along. So I don't know how long, like, timeline-wise that takes. Their, their mission was then, okay, we're going to go take on the tower. And then that's the last we hear from them. Yeah, but like by the time you arrive there, nothing has happened and the tower's still there. So I kind of wonder, did they just not get along at that stage? In theory, you could have already rescued Lucas. Like he could be free. 
or else he was somewhere else, but... I don't think Lucas is coming out of the sun top. I think he's got a lot of issues. Yeah, I, I think he's a goner. I think in the long term of the lore, whatever the Harbinger has done to him just hasn't come into play yet, and there's something more to what she has done or corrupted or told him. It's wild. I just, they're, I feel like they're purposely trying to, not because they don't have, like, the story to say stuff about, like, the Endless and the Harbinger. It's more of like, hey, we're trying to create, like, suspense and, like, trying to get people guessing. And then, you know, the secrets will be revealed later down the path. You know, we don't, they don't want to play all their cards just right away. That's because it's coming in the first story DLC available this fall. Think positive, guys. It'd be weird. Halo DLC. It's not really something I'm more used to. I'm I'm totally here for extended campaign island by island as we work our way around the Halo. Like, just give me that. But I need that to not take multiple years. I need it to be a little bit faster. It'll be nine years and <laughs> 11 months and then at Because they said it's a 10-year plan. So once 10, 10 years comes around, that's when we'll get the DLC. Uh, hopefully not. What else have we not talked about in this campaign, like, in, or in this story? Anything else to think of? Like, we had the setting up of the Mortal Reverie. We had the battle. We find out why it's in the state that it is. I think we kind of, have we hit all the major points? One thing I noticed is they do talk about ODSTs in this. Not all the ODSTs turned into Spartans. There are still ODSTs left. That's true. Although they do a very good job of killing them off a lot. There are some here, but they get massacred fairly regularly. But I have to imagine there still are a lot of special forces that aren't Spartans. I like the way when they were talking about when like Rubicon Protocol gets like initiated, they're like, sure, we're already doing this. And like, like who says, when they're going from like Firebase and it's like, we're, we stick with our boat crew group, but there's other groups out there just causing havoc. And especially they, they, they call out like hell they're like no our ODST troopers that are like the squad specializes in blowing up shit up and that's just what they're doing. They're going around taking and out They're like having like a body count and they're like playing almost like a game out of it, like who can kill the most banished. I think I thought that was cool. So I, I like the idea that there might still be pockets of dudes out there that we haven't seen yet, that there is teams of like ODSTs out there just wrecking wrecking shop. I feel like that sets up the future of what the audio logs are if we ever do get campaign DLC where you're not going to the fobs and getting logs maybe on the big story. You're getting logs from these other fire teams that are dropping them off at the base. Like, I think that would be cool. If they really want to add a cool feature into the game going forward, you need a little in-universe, like, leaderboard. The chief can slowly work his way up in the DLC with fake teams of marines and ODSTs like moving up and down the log past you all the time as they take out Banished. Like just make it a little like mini game just to give the universe a little character. Or they could do, it'd be really cool if they did like they did in the Assassin's Creed Brotherhood where like you train assassins and send them off to do missions and they bring back resources for you. Like that'd be cool if you had like you were sending off teams. Teeth was directing people to go on, like, you go over here and take out this high-value target and you come back with a weapon or some shit. Like, that'd be really cool. Oh, I've had a really dumb idea, but it's good. What if the leaderboard was just your friends and it was just tracking campaign score all the time? That would be cool, especially when with the, in bringing in co-op and stuff. That would be cool. What, what if that was just it and it was just like, oh, you're doing pretty good in campaign, but David's campaigning better than you are. Like, <laughs> damn it, now I've got to play more campaign. That's what they did in Halo 3 with like the scoreboard, like with score for each of the levels. Like you, it would show yours and then against all your buddies and if you had skulls and... It was Master Chief Collection did it as well. Yeah, if you just had like that in-universe on the side of the fob, like if you had a screen on the fob that give you your rank among your friends that play Halo Infinite, you'd just be like, God damn it, now I've got to play more. Little dumb things like that can be the most motivational. I feel like that sets it up in this book for like, oh yeah, this is totally a thing. And then you can just listen to audio logs about grizzled marines out there blowing bridges up and slaughtering the banished. I did love the... Um when they took out the Grum kind of camp. I thought that was pretty cool. Just like blowing up their methane nest. 
it was like a ticking time bomb and like and I liked that they were like hey we're going to hide right by the explosion because nobody's gonna look there they're all gonna look outside like in all directions and not right there and that was really smart yeah I I also like the touch towards the end when Hovarth meets up with the team just as they're about to go to the conservatory he meets up with them and he's like wow look at this grizzled team of marines and he like looks over at joe and he's like oh this guy's clearly a hardcore marine maybe an odst and you're like nah that's the or bender and he's like nah that's the barber mate he just he looks tough now and you're like this is how this team has come along i'd say they're either in the conservatory or they're like walking through the substructure to get to the conservatory yeah i think this was just before it but he's just like he he mistakes bender for a marine or an odst and you're like ah right we're just like the team have come a long way since the early days when they were just freaking out and vomiting all the time that's uh one other thing i wanted to mention was the fact that they hinted at some weapons that aren't in the game but are also in halo lore like i think it's stone either stone or kovan pulls out a dmr and i was like ooh, dmr and then there was a brute shot gorian uses a brute shot and i'm like I'm like, okay, maybe maybe these, these guns will end up in Halo Infinite because they're in this story. They'll show up in Forge, I'm sure, or sorry, in some aspects. I'm hoping we do get more of them added in down the line, like a lot more weapons in Forge. If they could just take a lot of the Halo 5 uh, Warzone weapons and add them into Forge would make for good modes. The other, actually, did we... Secret behind the scenes, I was missing for a few minutes there. Did we discuss the attack in the middle of the night? where the jackals and the brutes ambushed the boat team. No, we did not. Oh, the campsite? That was brutal. Can we talk about that? Because, like, that first ODST, he gets taken out with a battle axe to the chest and pinned into a tree, and then the the jackals start to, like, pick them off in the dark. Pick them off? You mean, like, eat them? Like, the jackals are, like, ravenous? The jackals are eating them because they say they, he talk, they talk about how the jackals look thinner and like more hostile, and then they like drag one of the bodies off at one stage and one of the marines. I think they're literally eating them in the woods. I think those are the skirmisher skirmisher skirmishers. Yeah, they're like wild and feral. Yeah, and there's these two brutes with them, and you're just like, oh, this is not good at all. Absolutely. The other thing I wanted to mention was the fact that most of the boat crew, except for like the Spartans and Murphy, didn't understand or didn't know about um, the significance of the Halo ring. And like there's this reveal where the rest of the boat crew like learns that like Halo can like destroy absolutely everything. And everyone's like, what the fuck? Like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah, we definitely have to stop the Banish now. I feel like they've set this up in the universe before because they kind of cover this in like smoke and shadow and that and point of light where they're basically going like okay we know more than the average person about the forerunners but like the average person just knows oh the forerunners are ancient aliens and they built all this cool shit but they don't know they don't know why like if they know that halos exist they think they're like a habitat in space they don't know that they're actually giant space weapons and they definitely don't seem to know too much about the flood they know about the flood because the flood landed in africa and they glassed half a continent to like wipe them out but i feel like they don't know that the forerunners made the halos to kill the flood no i think that's definitely kept secret because that would cause a lot of panic in reality yeah so like these guys as well even on the infinity don't know all the details like none of the boat crew even murphy knew what the plan was to get cortana they just knew there was a plan which kind of makes sense. They're kind of like most of these dudes are like a barber, a mortician, and a comms. Like they wouldn't be in the know. No, this is kind of like Halo's equivalent of lower decks. You're you're not on the top of the food chain when it comes to all this stuff. Let's see anything else. I feel really sorry for Hovarth because he spends so much of this book just on his fucking own. Yeah. Oh, and he keeps getting his ass. He gets beaten up. His armor. He just takes a lot of beatings. Yep. He's either getting his head kicked in, he's making friends with a brute that doesn't love him, or he's on his own, like, wandering the halo. Like, at several occasions, he's, like, just after a fight, and just collapses for, like, two days, and then wakes up again. (laughs) It's like, okay, and I'll keep going. I'll spend a week climbing his mountain and looking for a way down. I That's actually one thing they mentioned they talked about in this book, like, using 
like the natural like the animals like hunting animals to actually get food like they were making a point about like how the banished were like talking about like this herd of my assumption would be like space deer um and they like had them hidden or they were like terrified and so horvath's like yeah i'm just gonna move this out of the way so you guys can run away and uh, get away from the banished but I did like the in-book explanation for why the space deer and the space rhino aren't in the game. I was like, oh, the, the banished at the mall when they got here. There's only the gophers and the birds left because they haven't caught them all. And you're like, mm-hmm. It's definitely not because you had issues putting them in the game, isn't it, 343? I mean, it works. Yeah. Also, shout out to the mention of tossers again. Fantastic game. Everyone loves a good round of tossers. I forgot. Yeah, I forgot that that's from um... uh, Stomping on the Heels of a Foss. Yeah, it's pretty grim. Like if you want a good scary enemy, the brutes are always a good way to go because they are just like grotesque and horrifying. So on that end of things, it's very good. Yeah, they do make them pretty brutal uh, in this book. What did you think of the grunt who threw the canister of like methane into the cell and like killed a whole bunch of people? gas the prisoners yeah that was awesome that was pretty brutal that was that was it was cool it was totally unexpected they also mentioned the grunt i'm pretty sure they mentioned the grunt that's with the um radio towers and like halo infinite that so they, they they do mention a lot of like set up a lot of things for halo infinite like give things some backstory yeah overall i feel like it's a pretty solid book but then again i as we've discussed before I think the Flood's the same way, whereas this doesn't have the issue the Flood has, whereas the Flood as a novel retraces a lot of things you played in the game, and that's kind of boring. All the best bits of the Flood are the bits that take place around the game, whereas this novel, at least, even though it's tied into the game, you're like, it's in the six months between the intro cutscene and the next cutscene, so it's entirely, like, fine, and we only hear bits of it in audio log, so it's not like it's... That's it, yeah, once you stick to the audio logs, I think... You could kind of more or less do whatever you want and build a story around it. Absolutely. The fight at the end of like, let's go fight and take out a beacon and all that kind of stuff, that was kind of cool. It felt like it had a bit of weight because I genuinely didn't know if they would succeed or not because the game doesn't tell you. So like, you've no idea if their goal is to send out a met. Like, you know, at the start, like, oh, we're trying to stop them from getting to the conservatory. We know you failed doing that. I'm... We're, we're stopping you from doing something else and uh, whatever they were getting information from the underground so all these things kind of happen that you never knew about what i kind of want to do now is go back to campaign and look through it and see can i find these key points mentioned like i want to know there is one of the beacons that looks like a battle took place there and like there's doors blown off in the bottom of it and i'm like is this the beacon is the, is this the one that they sent the message from although it's not close to the conservatory because when I was thinking back, I was going like, there's nowhere close to the conservatory dig site that's a beacon. And I don't, I couldn't think of there was, because I thought all the beacons were on that final island. But like, I want to go and have a look, because I know even when I looked in Halopedia, they have screenshots of one of the bumblebees. And like, oh, this is the bumblebee that crashed with the boat crew. And I'm like, is this the one? Is that where it is? I'm like, interesting. I didn't. There's the cognitive dissidence of a... Uh, the map is a certain size and you're like, it's taken them days to walk across and you're like, it's not that big. I can run across it in about 20 minutes. But these guys, you, ha you have to like go, okay, it's actually much further to the hills from the tower than it looks. You know, we'll probably see when uh, there will probably be a Reddit post in the next few weeks where like, yes, I have compiled every single or at least position in Halo Infinite where, you know, it is mentioned in the book. I, I guarantee you that will be a thing. I'd love a map just showing me the book overlaying with the game of like, this is where this person died, this is where this fight took place. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, it would be cool to see all that stuff. Um, I would love to know what other trivia is in this because I didn't necessarily catch anything else, but it's always good to see like the ties and the stuff they've put together, but you need the community to sink their teeth into that a little bit. That's the only downside to doing these book clubs fresh off the off the grill, basically, is the community hasn't had time to tie all those strings together yet. I look forward to more of it. It's also interesting to see then that basically we are none the wiser about Palmer and Lasky. The bulk of the Infinity's forces are still unaccounted for. Yeah, like we, we don't know where they are. All we know is that the Halo jumped 
and Infinity is not there anymore. So Infinity may still exist. So the only other question I have is, how did Atriox get from Infinity to the surface in time for the jump? And have no one know that Infinity is completely dead or not? Like that's the last thing. Like it sounded from the description at the start before the jump that the battle in space was still very much kicking off when Zeta jumps away. They still talk about being able to look up into the sky and seeing weapons fire and stuff. Yeah, it was definitely like because the boat was still trapped and the team was still there when the the ring jumped. So like it had only been a couple of minutes, maybe an hour max. I think they said six or eight hours. Between the fight and the, the jump? Yeah, I think the Bumblebee, when they landed on the ground, they said they'd been in there for about six hours. And then they hear from Hovarth. And I think there's another couple of hours after that. I'm not sure. From the first talk to Hovarth until they're rescued isn't terribly long because he's making his way towards them. And then the Halo jumps and then his team gets wiped out. And like that all happens pretty quick. And then Kovan rescues them. I'm surprised he co Hovarth doesn't meet up with like Kovan and Stone and like the boat crew earlier like it seemed like he was like almost at their crashed bumblebee when the ring kind of fragmented or maybe just because he was on like a different fragment that floated away and ended up upside down that is how he got separated i think it could be a bit of that and they did say he was an hour away like a spartan can boot it pretty hard for an hour so they could have been further apart than you would think like if we're going with that in universe thing like probably i'd say running 30 or 40 miles in an hour is probably nothing to a spartan that's fair any last thoughts before we like wrap this thing up then no i think we pretty much covered everything um i like the book yeah i wish it came out sooner kind of wish it came out a little sooner agreed yeah i have to agree there i think that's this should have been out either at the same time or shortly after launch i feel like it would have added a lot more to it and we wouldn't have been sitting going how are they recording all these audio logs where are they recording them from why are they here like what wh why is he talking to the banish or to the harbinger lady and why is the recording on the data pad on the other end of the map things like that so i i do think it they maybe did this book a little disservice by not getting it out there at the time, but I would love to know the reasons for that, and hopefully someday we'll get an answer. Okay, I think that's pretty positive. Like, I I think I'm with you guys. It's a pretty decent book. It's pretty solid. Someday we will get Kelly back on, and we will quiz her about the, uh, the experience of writing a book that is so tied into so much other lore, in a way that none of her other novels are quite as beholden to it because it has to link up to so many audio logs and so many things in the game and all the rest of it. So I'd love to know what that experience was like. So we will see if we can get Kelly back on again. Well, I think on that note, then that will do us for this week. Guys, thank you once again for joining us for another book club. Like we mentioned at the top of the show, you can find every episode of all of Evolved stuff over on the website, evolvedhalo.com. It features links to our Discord server, our Facebook group, Patreon page, Xbox Live Club, and our contact info. Once again, another shout out to all of our patrons for your continued support. Head to patreon.com forward slash evolved halo to learn more about becoming a patron today. And finally, if you would like to leave us a voicemail about this or anything else, you can do that by calling the voicemail line 205 Evolve. That's 205 386 5833. And with that, I have been your host, Aaron. And until next time, Evolve! 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 Evolve!